I would like to call our second speaker, this time on the opposition side of the motion. His name is Sam Hunt. He is a first-year classicist at Pembroke College, and he won this slot through open audition. Sam, you have the ear of the hat. <coughs> This House believes that we were wrong to leave the European Union. I'd like to start by uh, talking a little bit about the definition of this motion, because in both speakers for the proposition, there was an implication that believing we were wrong to leave is somehow equivalent to wanting to reverse the decision. The first speaker of the proposition said that lovers of democracy should celebrate, and then the second speaker talked about pragmatism and the importance of respecting the democratic outcome of the referendum. Now, personally, I do not support a, re a second referendum. I do not support the revocation of Article 50. I support the implementation of the result of the 2016 vote. However, I can do that without it precluding me from believing that we were wrong to vote to leave, to, to vote to leave in 2016. Because that is the motion here. We were wrong, past tense. If we go back to what Christine said in her speech, we haven't yet left. So this motion can't be about future implementation. This motion has to be an historical motion. It has to be counterfactual. So, having said all of that, I think I should at least preface my speech um, with a, a little bit of a confession, which is that until about a year ago, I was a Brexiteer, and a relatively ardent one at that. So much so that I even led the Vote Leave campaign in my school's mock referendum in 2016, <laughs> only to lose rather crushingly in a 70-30 vote. <laughs> However, I think it is an unhelpful misconception that we have um, that Euroscepticism and Brexit advocacy should necessarily be synonymous, that they are automatically, ideologically interchangeable. And this is very much the plea that I make to Brexiteers in this room tonight. Ask yourselves, does the best hope of redressing my grievances with the EU coincide with leaving it? Or am I just buying into a collective narrative that has speciously established this equation? Unsurprisingly, most of the arguments we ever hear advocating our departure from the bloc focus on what is wrong about the European Union, whether that be the, jurisdic the jurisdiction of the ECJ, um, the uh, arrogation of notional sovereignty by the European Commission, uh, the dangers of mass migration, etc., etc. And it's very easy to hear all of these arguments and be persuaded that the EU is failing and that we can somehow scrub out all of these problems just by voting to leave. But if you believe that leaving is the solution, as I did for a number of years, then I think you are selling yourself a couple of lies. First, I realize now that I was treating the campaign badges of leave and remain as if they were cut and dried political realities, monolithic alternatives with nothing in common. Whereas in reality, we continue to be closely integrated with many of the political and economic projects of the EU that we theoretically voted to quit in 2016. And then the second fallacy, I think, is that leaving the EU is somehow equivalent to having never gone in in 1973. William was even keen to look back to the 1920s, and at one point, I think, the Augustan Principate. But, but, this, but this, again, is to underestimate the extraordinary structural change that membership of the European Union has imposed on us and our relationship with other member states in the intervening time. One of Yanis Varoufakis's favorite analogies to uh, describe the EU is, of course, that of Hotel California, whose closing lyrics run, last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Relax, said the nightman. We are programmed to receive. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. <laughs> what do I mean by all of this practically? 
Well, let's take the customs union. Nominally, of course, we have departed the European customs union, but if we want any hope of establishing a frictionless free trade agreement with the EU over the course of the next year, we are going to have to consent to the overwhelming majority of customs union regulatory standards um, in order to facilitate um, trading compatibility uh, for the 50-odd percent of our exports that go to the EU and the 40-odd percent of our imports from non-EU countries that pass through the EU. And then there's the European Court of Justice. Under the terms of the Withdrawal Act, we've left it, its jurisdiction. Or have we? Because also under the terms of the Withdrawal Act, the entire corpus of extant EU law is directly transposed into UK statute books. Furthermore, since 1998, we have gradually integrated almost all of the provisions um, of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law. Accepted? Wait, microphone, and you're on committee, you should know better. Uh, the European Council and the European Convention on Human Rights and the EU are completely separate entities. We're not leaving the European Convention on Human Rights and we're not leaving the uh, jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. This is precisely the point that I'm making. These are, when we say the EU, I think it's a mistake to believe that we're talking about some sort of unitary, indivisible whole. Instead, we're talking about a sort of aegis term under which sit all sorts of different institutions. You have the European Court of Justice and the Single Market and the Customs Union, and our integration with these things, our integration even with the European Convention of Human Rights, entails integration with the political project and all of the things that have been carried out in the intervening time under its general aegis. The EU is not a thing per se, it is an aggregate. And I am arguing that we have not really left it because we continue to be integrated with many of these uh, sub-institutions, as it were. And then a, 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 an, another excellent example of which is, of course, the host of EU-run organizations um, for, responsible for developing markets, like the European Atomic Energy Committee, of which we continue to be a member. And consequently, my argument, I suppose, is that much as Brexiteers may want to have their cake and eat it, there is simply no such thing um, as a clean break, an in-out binary dichotomy. Even William readily admitted that this is idealistic. However, when we were a member state of the EU, we were at least afforded a stake in the political bodies that represent the best available vehicle for controlling our inescapable relationship with the continent. Brexiteers of the Rees Mogg bent like to argue that uh, the EU cost us our sovereignty um, because of the poor democratization of authoritarian organizations like the Central Bank and the Commission. However, when we were in the European Union, we did have numerous representatives in the European Parliament, and, we did, and, our, and our exe the executive branch of our government did have a permanent seat on the Council of Ministers. Therefore, isn't our sovereignty even more compromised now that we have opted out of the European Parliament, opted out of the Council of Ministers, opted out of the favour of the European establishment, thereby rendering us even less, thereby leaving us with even less internal power to negotiate and vote on our involvement with the many EU structures and organisations in which we are still, in practice, deeply implicated? And so we reach the conclusion that if, that because of the nature of the centrifugal authority that the European Union exerts, we could only have hoped to reform it from within and indeed to hold, and indeed to conserve the more moderate elements of it, to hold back the tide of federalization that William talked about. For example, in, um, in 2004 or five, I think it was, um, the there was a proposal for the establishment of a pan-continental EU constitution. Not just one that was specific for the EU, but one that which would have to be implemented in each, of, declined, in each of the subsidiary member states. Now, the only reason that didn't happen is because French and Dutch voters elected in a plebiscite for it not to happen. And we had that blocking power when we were in the European Union. We could have retained our capacity to block major measures that we saw as undemocratic, authoritarian, homogenizing, etc. 
There is nothing problematic about a Eurosceptic nation working within the confines of the EU. In fact, there is arguably something positively strategically advantageous about it. We could have been that check on the federalization that William talked about. And of course, he didn't just talk about the federalization for Britain. He talked about the general principle of the nation state. If we want to preserve that principle for our European allies, then staying in and, and continuing to hold that capacity for change is surely essential. In fact, I would even argue, dare I say it, that there is something of a moral injunction to remain within the European Union in order to reform it. One of the episodes in recent EU history that I personally found most rebarbative was the EU's treatment of Greece in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 crash. You know, they granted 110 billion euros, the largest loan in human history, to the most bankrupt country on earth, and then sent officials from the IMF over to impose measures that they knew would shrink their economy. But here's the thing, if you think that um, the EU is an ailing bureaucracy that has imposed, that has imposed a series um, of measures designed to uh, refloat the Western European banks that has uh, inflicted severe bankruptcy on its smaller member states, then isn't it just lazy, not to mention ineffective, to throw your toys out of the pram and say, I want out? Not only is it an irresponsible abrogation of our internationalist obligation to try to redress the flaws we see in the EU, rather than just pretend they didn't exist. But it is also simply not realistic, because after 47 years of uh, political, economic, social, judicial, military and scientific integration and entrenchment, there is just no such thing as out. There is only self-harm after which you realize that you're still in the same body. It's just more painful to live within that body. The EU is a fact of life. It is Hotel California. We should therefore have accepted our obligation to work within the existing framework and do the best we could to improve it. And that is why, as a Eurosceptic, I beg to oppose this motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for that. And I've enjoyed the symmetry of a Remainer arguing on the Brexit side of the motion and a Lever arguing on the Remain side of the motion.